turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> and last week we began our new series on the book of Colossians. And I'm going to read through uh, from verse 3 through verse 14. We're going to particularly look at verses 9 through 14 where Paul prays for the Colossians. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you had for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before, the, before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we had not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Father, we see this prayer that Paul prayed for the Colossians, as he says regularly. We pray that you would be at work in our midst doing these exact same things that would be increasing in the knowledge of God and strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance, patience with joy. We pray that you would make us a thankful people as we remember and think about the fact that we have been delivered and rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of your Son in whom we have forgiveness. Pray that you would remind us of these things, build them into our lives more strongly than before. In Jesus' name, amen. After some introductory greetings and a subtle reminder of their faith in Christ, Christian hope, and love for each other, uh, he also mentions um, uh, Epaphras, path, uh, he's our beloved fellow servant. Uh, Paul had not traveled to Colossae, to Colossae and it was Epaphras that apparently had done the missionary work there and presented the gospel to them. Paul then prays to them. We see in Colossians 1.9, and so from the day we heard, we had not ceased to pray for you. Uh, before we look closer at the, the body of this prayer, I want to point out the urgent consistency of Paul's prayers of the Colossians. Uh, he prays for their stability in Christian truth, for their Christian growth to be there regularly. And prayer is vital for a healthy Christian life. And it's an important means that God uses to carry out His eternal purposes. Uh, Andrew Bonar, uh, the great hymn writer and, and pastor of the 1800s, wrote in his diary, Tonight I gave myself to a time of waiting upon the Lord. I had not been much in the spirit of prayer, but now several things have come, become clear to me. I realize I had not communed enough with the Lord, nor come to Him as often as I should. Little forethought has been given to the requests I have made. There has been much conversing and outward engagement with men, but I have not been occupied enough with God Himself. I also realize that a closeness to Him gives abundant strength, and is like sunlight shining through the clouds on a gloomy day. Well, Paul's prayers are recorded for us in several places in the New Testament, and they do reflect this idea. 
uh, Paul's prayers for others had a strong element of praying for growth, for understanding the things of God, for particular needs. And the petitions Paul prays to the Colossians address significant aspects of Christian growth or sanctification. He mentions in this prayer that they would live a life worthy of the Lord, and using that theme, I think we can think of some of the ideas in this prayer. First, a life worthy of the Lord begins with a clear knowledge of the, of the will of God itself. You see in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we had not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Four times in this opening section of the book of Colossians, Paul mentions the idea of knowing and understanding the truth of the gospel and the will of God. In, in verse 5, he says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, uh, this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Verse 6, which has come to you, and indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Notice the emphasis on truth. And then the passages we just read in 9 and 10. It's impossible to try to serve God without knowing first how we may have the relationship with Him through faith in Christ, or to know what He desires of us. It's always troubled me when I see the, the polls that when they survey Christian people, evangelicals, and ask them the most basic theological questions and get tremendously absurd answers. And um, it's uh, just recently I saw a survey that uh, Wigener Ministries did, uh, the State of Theology in America, they called it, and these were all polled among self-confessed evangelicals, and it was more than a half did not believe Jesus uh, was God. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on like that. And uh, then you begin to talk about ethical issues. I remember when I was working on my, my first doctoral dissertation, a, a project on Christian ethics, I was surveying, there was a man in the college who would worked for Gallup, and he helped me put together a, a survey. That was, you know, very well done, but it had a section of true and false at the end, and Christianity believes that, and there was various ethical issues. Um, I had some Christians that did almost the exact opposite on every single point. And there was, I was trying to get unchurched, uh, hopefully really non-Christian people to answer. I had one man who was a self-professed atheist, and he answered every one of them correctly. He knew what Christianity taught. He didn't believe any of it, but, uh, except a few of the honesty things. But, uh, but, but he knew better than a lot of the Christians that I, I surveyed, which is a sad commentary on what's been preached and taught and so forth. And, uh, uh, of course, the knowledge that Paul is speaking about is not some esoteric, mystical knowledge, but a concrete understanding of God's redemptive revelation in Christ. This understanding of Christ and the Gospel has practical application. Verse 10, he mentions, so we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, so we pleasing to Him. Uh, Douglas Moo commented, he said, the false teaching that Paul was writing against in the book of Colossians will hold no attraction for the Colossians if they truly come to know and understand that they have already received the true Word of God and that they have been transferred by God's own power into the new realm of God's own Son. And just look at me at some of the parallel passages that mention the same idea. We read earlier the Ephesians chapter 1, really the, the whole prayer there, but look at verse 17 of Ephesians 1 when Paul is praying for them. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him. 
goes on, have in your, the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of this glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of this power to us who believe? I mean, it's just an amazing prayer for them and an important prayer. We should pray for ourselves, our children, our wives, our husbands, uh, friends, relatives. Important ideas. In Philippians chapter 1, just a quick mention of Paul praying for them. In chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and be, so be pure and blameless to the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. And then, just in the little book of Titus, the very first verse, is kind of the standard introductory idea or similar to many of Paul's epistles. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. And uh, notice the idea of truth being connected to godliness or living a life worthy of the Lord. And notice how all these passages connect the idea of coming to a true knowledge of God with the gospel and with changed wives. Wives that live to the glory of God because there is a profound understanding of what God commands and desires of His people as well as understanding the gospel itself. You could think about some similar Old Testament passages like Proverbs 1-7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do His commandments. This knowledge of God results in the wisdom to the best means in order to live more fully to God's glory. Uh, of course, resting and trusting in Christ. And again, the practical purpose of Paul's prayer is that they would be filled with the knowledge of His will, Stated in verse 10, so that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Why do you study the Bible? Why do you, in your regular and deep reading of Scripture, seek to inculcate the truths of God's Word into your life? Because the more we know God and the things of God, the more we're able to live to His glory. They add the more we are also protected from falsehood that can come, surround us and come to us. The better we un you understand the nature and attributes of God, the better you're able to worship Him. The better you understand God's commandments, the better you are to make proper ethical decisions and live properly before Him. The more you understand His purposes in creation and providence, the better you are able to trust Him in the midst of trials or suffering. Studying God's Word, building it into the fabric of our lives is not just some task we're supposed to slug through as a part of Christian living, although sometimes there's certainly discipline involved, but it is a basic foundation of all Christian living. If we're going to have a vital life in our personal Christian lives and in the church, it must spring from truth. Now, R. Kent Hughes, uh, his little book, Disciplines of the Godly Man, uh, gives an example. He says, along with reading the Word, we ought to be reading good books. Uh, the brilliant Jewish radio talk show host Dennis Prager, a man who makes sure he is well informed, said in a recent interview on The Door, this is about 25 years ago, one thing I noticed about evangelicals, they do not read. They do not read the Bible. They do not read the great Christian thinkers. They have never heard of Aquinas or Calvin or 
any of these. He said if they're Presbyterian, they'd never raid the founders of Presbyterianism. I don't understand that. As a Jew, that's confusing to me. The commandment of study is so deep in Judaism that we immerse ourselves in study. God gave us a brain, aren't we to use it in his service? When I walk into an evangelical's home and see a total of 30 books, most of them bestsellers, I don't understand. I had bookcases of Christian books and I'm a Jew. Why do I have more Christian books than 98% of the Christians in America? That's bizarre to me. Well, it is bizarre. Hughes comments, he said, it is bizarre, especially when a commitment to Christ is a commitment to believe in things that go beyond uh, the, the surface of life. And sadly, the bulk of non-reading Christian public are men. Of course, the book is addressed to men who buy only 25% of all Christian books. And of course, one of the sad things is you go into Christian bookstore, one of those places, and most of the books you see um, are a bunch of nothing. In fact, I can remember when The Shack came out, an heretical book, and its message is right up in front, you know, on a big display. And I would walk through airports and see people reading it. You know, one side it's uh, modalistic, and the other side is tritheistic, and, and, you know, and God's not sovereign. He's doing the best he can, but he can't do anything. And that's why evil happens. Jonathan Edwards, when he was a young man, wrote 70 resolutions. He was a late teenager. And two of these, I think, are particularly relevant to this idea. Resolution 28, he said, Resolved to study the Scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently as that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. And at, uh, at Yale, where he had gone to, to college as a teenager, uh, uh, they had in the library his Bible, which he had cut the, the back off of, and then carefully, either he or his wife, had sewn a piece of paper in between every page. On every page of the Bible, written sometimes this way and then that way to say the paper, uh, is, are his comments on every page of the Bible. His resolution number 61, resolve that I will not give way to that listlessness which I find unbends and relaxes my mind from being fully and fixedly set on religion, which he meant theology, whatever excuse I may have for it. And think about your own life. <clears throat> Do you have the commitment in your life to so steadily, constantly, and frequently study the Scriptures so that you can plainly perceive yourself growing in the knowledge of the Word of God. It's a, a challenging way it's said. Do you give in to that apathy or listlessness in your pursuit of God and your understanding of the will of God? Is it a regular habit in your life to read good Christian literature, the classics of the faith, particularly those that have stood the test of time? Uh, again, the goal and object of Paul's prayer is not simply for them to have knowledge, but that our knowledge and understanding would lead to a life. It would be applied in a way that pleases God. The more God's people know of God, the more they can love Him, the more they can serve Him and worship Him. And then we also see four characteristics and evidences of living a life worthy to the Lord set forth in this prayer. In fact, the Greek in verses 10 to 12 contain four participles that are aspects of living a life worthy of the Lord. Verse 10, we see bearing fruit in every good work. It says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work. Uh, these characteristics are to be descriptive of God's people. Living a life worthy of the Lord means that we are to be a people whose lives are characterized by these traits, to be an ethical people. A missionary in India was once teaching a, a Bible study to a group of Hindu ladies, and halfway through the lesson, one lady uh, got up and walked out. A short time later, she came back and she seemed to listen more intently than ever. At the close of the study, the missionary inquired, why did you leave the meeting? Weren't you interested? And, she says, oh, oh yes, I was very interested, but 
and I was impressed with what you had to say about Christ. In fact, so much so that I went out to your carriage driver to see whether you lived the way you talked. <laughs> and when he said you did, I hurried back so I wouldn't miss out on anything. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said, if we would show decision for the truth, we must not only do so by our tone and manner, but by our daily actions. A man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as pounds and his words as pence. If his life and his doctrine disagree, the mass of lookers on accept his practice and reject his preaching. We must show our decision for the truth by the sacrifices we are ready to make in terms of living the life. And that last phrase always has resonated with me. My dad's business practices, I remember he always had the, the statement he would make that we're going to do what's right uh, by our customers and the people we deal with, even if it costs us money. And I saw him do that many times. Second, in the end of verse 10, we're to be increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul makes clear that knowledge of God is both the starting point and a resulting characteristic of the God-pleasing life. This is a normal aspect of Christian living. Again, the more a person knows of God and obeys God, the greater their understanding of God becomes. For example, at the very beginning of the book of Job, Job already knew God and expressed profound trust and faith in Him. Uh, in fact, you know, the statement is made by God numerous times, look at my servant Job, there's no one like him on the earth. Fearing God, turning away from evil, those types of statements. In fact, he's called basically the most sanctified man on the face of the earth. But after he goes through the time of suffering and all those things, and there is a time when he is restored, in fact, it's always an amazing set of chapters near the end of the book when uh, basically God appears to Job and says, I'll answer all your questions. All you have to do is answer a few simple things I ask you. And then he basically asks him over 70 questions about how he ordered and created and sustains the universe. <laughs> and uh, just tell me these simple little nothings, Job, and I'll answer your questions. In verse 42, First few verses. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Here and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you from the, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So I have a true vision of God. It leads to me to dramatic repentance. And of course an acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and power and wisdom. Colossians 1.11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And uh, for all endurance and patience with joy. When a pro person grows in clear understanding of God and His will, his strength and courage increase. Notice that he's strengthened in accordance with God's glorious might for the purpose of endurance or steadfastness and patience. Realize what a rare trait, trait the idea of endurance or steadfastness or perseverance is in the Christian world. Uh, so often I see people who get excited about the Lord, uh, they're all bubbly and so forth, and within six months it's all worn off. And they're not so excited anymore. Uh, Paul, in a similar way, prays this in Ephesians 1. Verses 17 through 20 in this prayer there. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, 
having the heart, eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of this glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of this power toward us who believe, according to the working of this great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Um, Paul prays that they would be strengthened in accordance with the power of God, same power demonstrated in the resurrection of Christ. And you pray for God's power in your life so that you can persevere in your Christian living with all patience and endurance. In your confession of faith, do you pray for our perseverance in that, so that you would have courage to boldly confess Christ? I mentioned Andrew Bonar a moment ago. His father often said to him, Son, pray that we may both well wear, wear well to the end. And that's a great prayer. It's a passage that's often used in funerals and it's often very appropriate. Uh, I remember using this passage in our past elder Bub's funeral when he went to be with the Lord. In 2 Timothy uh, 4, 6, and 7, when Paul said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Uh, it's a great epitaph for anyone's life. Paul prays essentially this of the Colossians and the Ephesians. Pray this through yourself and pray it for your children, your husband, your wife. Pray for the, God's power to be at work in your life toward perseverance and endurance in your Christian brothers and sisters and in your own life. Um, son, pray that we may both wear well to the end. It's an important prayer, it's an important means that God uses us for the strengthening and care of His people. And then fourth, in verses 11 through 13, Colossians 1, it says, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Throughout Paul's epistles, he stresses the necessity of thanksgiving repeatedly. I think the reason why thanksgiving should permeate our Christian thinking, our Christian lives, is given in verses 12 to 14. It is God the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And if you're in Christ, here is a work of God the Father in your life. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Think about what that means. Several aspects of our redemption are mentioned here. First, God the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance through the work of Christ, the sending of His Son, the accomplishment of that work. Of course, the application of that work uh, by the Holy Spirit. It mentions God has delivered us in the domain of darkness from the satanic kingdom, the evil cultures in which we live, all those things, and transferred us to the kingdom of His Son. While the word adoption is not used here, and other passages are very vivid on adoption, and very clear on that, certainly the idea of that can be behind this to a degree. If you think about the passage we read in 1 John 3, 10 and following, where Children of God and the children of the devil are evident by this. And we are rescued, are delivered, are transferred out of that domain, out of that spiritual evil family into God's family. And when 
uh, you know, adoptions take place in human condition, human world, usually through either death of parents or some you know, parents putting a child up for adoption for various reasons, uh, adoption takes place. Well, the devil does not place his children up for adoption. God intervenes and rescues us, transfers us the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. And then we see we have forgiveness of our sins through Christ's work. Think about what that means, that the, the real guilt that we had but before a righteous and holy God is truly forgiven, is truly gone. Many true Christians continue to struggle with guilt from past sins. They, they're really Christians. They are truly forgiven in Christ. And we are called to trust God's promise in this regard. Of course, like Romans 8, 1, that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. J.C. Ryle, in commenting on the woman who had washed Jesus' feet with her tears uh, and with her, wiped them with her hair, in contrast to the hard-hearted Pharisee Simon, who invited him to his house and didn't take, do anything of the normal uh, host responsibilities, he commented this way, he said, the, <clears throat> the sense of the having our sins forgiven is the mainspring and life blood of love to Christ. The only way to make men holy is to teach and preach free and full forgiveness through Jesus Christ. The secret of being holy ourselves is to know and feel that Christ has pardoned our sins. The heart which has experienced the pardoning love of Christ is the heart which loves Christ and strives to glorify Him. I think the more we contemplate the reality of that and what that truly means, it affects every aspect of our Christian living. Notice that all these points emphasize that our salvation is completely of God's sovereign grace. A person receives an inheritance as a gift. It's not earned. It is God who has qualified us to receive this inheritance. God has sovereignly delivered us in the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of Christ, His beloved Son. We do not take ourselves out of that domain of darkness. Here's a work of God the Father rescuing us. In fact, we are absolutely powerless to bring about that change. And Paul may have been thinking about Acts 26, one of the places in the book of Acts where he gives his personal life story. It's in one of his defenses. So I've always found particularly Acts 26 a very strong account of this because of certain little details he adds. Starting at verse 9, he said, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. Notice I tried to make them blaspheme. Well, how do you do that? Threaten to kill their wives, their husbands, their children, torture, and all that type of idea. I always think of this passage how after World War, during World War II, many Jewish people in concentration camps would memorize the, the faces of guards and commandants. And then after the war, remember there was the effort to hunt those people down and bring them to least earthly justice. Well, to a Christian living in the area of Jerusalem, Judea, at that time, the face of that guard, that commandant, that torture was Saul of Tarsus. Remember when he was first miraculously saved and rode to Damascus and came back to Jerusalem after some time in Damascus that 
the church there was very suspicious. Rightly so. Maybe he's just putting on an act to figure out who we all are and then drag us off to prison. Well, verse 12, in this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And we had all fallen to the ground. To turn. Yeah. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to point you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen and seen me, that you have seen me, and those in which I will appear to you. Notice this verse, delivering you from the people and the Gentile and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. If you're in Christ now, if you believe in Jesus, Remember the incredible grace you have received in being transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the power of Satan, and you have received forgiveness and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. The Colossians were aware that often early earthly rulers, when they conquered people, would transplant the the conquer people from one country to another. You can remember how the Assyrians, when they conquered northern Israel, took them all out of northern Israel, most of the people, and took them over into their area, 722 B.C. Or the Babylonian exile of the southern kingdom, 586 B.C. However, we have been transplanted not from liberty to slavery, but from slavery to liberty. We were slaves of sin, dead in sin, unable to free ourselves, and God sovereignly acted, acted through the work of Christ, and the application and work of the Holy Spirit, to free us from slavery and the dominion of Satan's kingdom and transfer us to Christ's kingdom. Has God granted you faith and repentance? Do you rely upon Jesus and Him alone for your salvation? If you don't, I urge you to flee to Him, to throw yourself upon Him. And if you're in Christ, again, think about what has been done for you. Uh, I think gratitude to God and be motivated and compelled by that gratitude is a significant aspect of the life worthy of the Lord. As we contemplate that, think about it regularly, it should fill our heart with thanksgiving to God and call us to worship and service. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that surely praise and thanksgiving are ever to be the great characteristics of the Christian life. A farmer who had listened to an exposition of the text from Isaiah 1-3, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider, was giving food to his livestock, when one of his oxen, evidently grateful for the care, began to lick his bare arm. <laughs> and the farmer was convicted, and he exclaimed, It's true. This poor animal is more grateful to me than I am to God, and yet I'm in debt to God for everything. Well, when you look at these characteristics that are mentioned in Colossians 1, do you pray these things to be present in your life? If you haven't, read through the prayer a few times this week. Pray it. Pray these things. 
Ask God to give you either a desire for a clear knowledge of the will of God and the truth of the gospel, that that would be stronger in your life than in the past, so that you would live to the glory of God and truly want to do that. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the mercy we've received in Jesus, for the care you have provided in our lives on a daily basis. And even in the midst of, of suffering, of trials, of grief that we've gone through in our lives, we know that you never forsake us. Pray that you would be at work in our lives to have a deep desire to know you, to love you, to trust you, and that you would work those things into our lives more fully. We ask you to forgive us those times when we doubt your goodness or doubt your plan for us plan which often we don't understand, but help us to trust you. Bring us back repeatedly to the grace and mercy we've received in Jesus. Remind us of how much grace we have received. In Jesus' name.